Is that uh, the biggest uh, photographic uh, retrospective uh, so far oh, yeah, of your yeah, work? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I kept it all together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not seen only in books, but the, the exhibition's better than the catalogue, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. it should be. It should be. <laughs> <laughs> The camera, remember, is older than photography. Photography is only the chemical invention of how to put the image on a flat surface uh, with light uh, uh, that reacts to things. It had been used by painters before. Uh, the camera obscura is old. You know, if you make a hole in a box, it projects upside down on a wall that has been known for a long time. The camera wasn't invented in the 19th century, only the chemical process. Uh, the chemical process has changed, but this lens is still the same kind. We're still looking at it. Our cameraman here, you're looking through a hole. You're looking at like a window, at me, and so on. I don't connect with you over here. That was what I thought to get involved with taking this void away would be more interesting. Photography crosses a, a border. Um, I think it, it, it's become a collage. Hockney used photographic images and created something that pertained more to the condition of, of painting. So I, I am still debating with myself about you know, is photography an art, or is it a fantastic tool? Um, but I think what Hockney did was uh, something different in a way. He, he's not like Cartier-Bresson or Mapplethorpe or somebody like that. He, he, he's, uh, he's a painter who's taken a series of images with a camera and rearranged them on a flat surface, and I think that makes it something else. I experimented with photography in a way uh, for about a four or five year period in the 80s. I must tell you, I didn't care whether it was art or not, and people criticized me. What are you doing, wasting your time with that stuff, David? Why don't you paint, draw? I didn't really care. I thought, well, I make, uh, made a lot of discoveries, for myself anyway, so I took no notice of that. He keeps photograph albums going all the way back to the early 60s, and I don't know how many dozens of these there are now, all in the same large format. It's very curious how it started because the Centre Pompidou was preparing a retrospective of his photography. And in order to make the selection, the curator, Alain Sayag, had taken a lot of rolls of Polaroid film along with him so they could quickly record the ones that they thought they might use in the show. And when they finished working and Sayag went back to Paris, David found himself with lots of rolls, uh, lots of boxes of leftover Polaroid film. So he thought, well, I might as well use it. So he started playing with it. I began with using a Polaroid camera. Uh, uh, here, you look at it. Uh, the first ones were done in uh, Los Angeles, where I live. Uh, here, though, is one of Bill Brandt. This was uh, English, made in London. Uh, in uh, May 1982, and Bill Brandt was a, a famous English photographer, uh, made quite a few memorable images, um, some of the north of England, about when I was born, I do remember that. He came to visit me, I was uh, quite thrilled by this, and I said, could I make a picture of you? And he was quite fascinated as I began to construct it. And I'll point out now that, say, you see one, two, three, four, five sets of hands. But when you look at this, he doesn't look like a monster with ten hands. You are well aware it's one pair of hands seen five times. So we're putting time in it in a different way to this. If you have a Polaroid camera, 
and you begin to do this, you'll realize uh, how close I am to compose that. What are you doing? Do you see my idea about drawing? That line, when I'm composing that, it's very important that that just does that. So you needed a single lens reflex. I'm focusing only on the corner, what's important there. I'm naturally constructing the picture here. He watched me make it. You begin here. I can make the edges wherever I want, like in a painting. In that sense, I have no idea where the edge of this is going to be. Originally, I called these drawing with a camera because I felt the decisions you make seem to be similar here. Uh, here, I put myself then, and a picture even not quite developed, meaning I had shot the Polaroid of the undeveloped Polaroid that freezes the undeveloped <laughs> Polaroid, uh, playing with that. I think the, the joiners, as I believe he calls them, um, are in a way quite amazing. I, I prefer the later ones, the, the Polaroid ones, the grid is too present. When he just makes the kind of collage of the photographs, I think he does things that are quite extraordinary within the world of, of photographs. Um, and he does uh, expand the, the medium in ways that I don't think anybody had ever thought of before. Eventually, I accepted the grid. I accepted the white. I just put them down, accepted it neatly, laid it down. Everyone has equal value in a way. Here, we just began the picture, because actually it's a picture of people looking at a picture who are also looking at something that looks like a picture. Um, I'll tell you, originally, the scene is in Coxwold in Yorkshire. On that day, it happened to be an open day for gardens. Uh, you know, busloads of little ladies from York had turned up, and you're walking around. It's rather charming. These people, I do not know, are not posed there. I just am walking past, and I see them. I think, well, what, what are they doing? They're looking at something. They're actually looking at a garden that was open. So I ran back and uh, just took the snap. They're looking, I'm looking at them looking, really. And uh, didn't think much about it, it's just another little photograph I'd taken. And then uh, back in LA, I probably printed it up or printed up another realized it was quite interesting. It's about looking itself. Um, you are looking, they are looking, and you go on back. Um, we then made a bigger one. I made it for Salt's Mill, actually. Uh, it's in the diner there. It's on the wall. I also wanted to test how would the color last and so on. Well, it's lasting very well, the Salt's Mill, actually. Um, I couldn't resist taking another picture of it, and I think this is actually from a 10 by 8 camera. We set up carefully, and uh, I got people to stand in front, including myself. We composed it. I'm stood here in front of a camera. I pointed out if you had another camera at the back, you could step back. It takes you, shows you something else as well. Uh, stepping back reveals more. It has vast implications for us, really, political all kinds of things. I mean, the moment you step back and see cameras at work, you realize <laughs> this isn't casual. I am performing here in front of it, aren't I, and so on. Uh, I'm well aware how somebody sees this picture, uh, and so on. That's what it's about. <laughs> Every image is an artifice, essentially, however much you think it's a documentary. It's an artifice, actually, and it led me into areas that were interesting, exciting, a new view of what the camera could do. It opened it out into another way for me. The 
again, we can see that there's, there's been this sort of fight against what he would, I suppose, describe as the, the tyranny of single point perspective. And uh, just as the Cubists wanted to see an object from all sides simultaneously, Hockney's photographs, in, in the most graphic and exceptional way, showed you that. And the thing that is astonishing is that pe people who might recoil in front of a Cubist painting or um, can read those photographs effortlessly. They see exactly what's going on. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's like a lot of brilliant ideas. They're, they're very simple at root, but it takes that mind to, to see the brilliance in the simplicity. Cubism is an acknowledgement that it's only perceptions of reality that are pictures, not reality. I've always thought this is uh, unfortunately named Cubism, it's not about cubes, really. They were the first pictures that people didn't know what they were. The first pictures that would confuse a viewer. Until then, you always thought you would see, that's a horse, that's a pot. It seemed you could see it. Cubism, or what it was called, was the first time Things, shapes had changed. They looked different. Why? What is this? People would ask. Before you'd really grasped it, another kind of picture had appeared that seemed far more realistic, the moving picture. As a child, he used to go to the cinema all the time in Bradford, and he'd notice in the movies that there were these very strong shadows and he thought that's very strange because he, he hardly ever saw shadows like that in Bradford so that appealed to him he already knew that there must be another different world out there from what he was experiencing I lived in Hollywood where there are many people working on pictorial problems how can you show reality in a more vivid way and so on uh, I live in the middle of it and take some interest in that aspect. I think that whole question of time and, and on how something is recorded in a painting as opposed to a photograph has been of concern to him most of his adult life. And, and the a bigger splash is one of the first manifestations of it. Those paintings in the mid-60s, including a bigger splash, have a border of bare canvas around them which looks like the white border of the snapshots that he would have got back from the chemist at the time. Um, he was very aware that one was looking at the painting as a substitute for photograph or as a grossly enlarged photograph remade by hand. I now think it's not capable of showing grandeur, actually, this looking through a lens. Not totally, whereas when I was young, I thought it could. I think most people thought it could. I think you have to use something else now, or more than one viewpoint. The experience of involvement with photography is very clearly manifested in all the work he was doing, and playing with reverse perspective, playing with different ways of representing space. You know, I'm a bit slow sometimes in things, really thinking, what well, you're doing, a, I did a painting with reverse perspective in 1974. Then never again touched that idea for nearly 10 years. It did not dawn on me what one had opened up, actually. Um, here is a chair, simple little chair in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. I was doing 40 pages for Vogue magazine. Uh, this is about 1985. Uh, they said it could be about anything. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'd like to point, develop this photography that can be put on a page rather well that acknowledges the page has an edge, even if my photography was trying to expand the edge. You have to accept Vogue magazine can't go on this way and this way. It's just there. So I started moving, acknowledging my movement. Now, here, if you see the, the perspective you think should go that way, that way, not this way. 
But the moment the reason it goes this way is I'm walking past the chair. I see it this side, then the front, and then that side. If you do it that way, it means you've stood still. In fact, you're not quite there, actually. I began to then discover that perspective is a fascinating subject. Uh, just at the moment being avoided, it probably has been at other times, but its problems won't go away. They're built into pictures, they're built into depictions. Depiction goes on whether painting does it or not. We want to depict the world, that's why the camera's here, why people have cameras, they want to depict their visions of it, their feelings of it, that's why a lot of amateur photographers, that's why uh, a lot of people want to paint, draw, do it. It's a deep instinct uh, we have. We did a show in Arles of photography, and Van Gogh, of course, lived in Arles, France. And like everybody else, I think Van Gogh is a great, great artist, marvelous artist. Um, his chair, that is now, I think, in the National Gallery, London. Uh, my father, whenever he came to London, always wanted to go see Van Gogh's chair and the boots, the pair of boots painted. And I knew it worked on him. It was not because some critic had said, this is terrific, or they asked artists to respond to Van Gogh, so I painted this for the foundation and gave it to them in Arles. I point out it's painted in homage to Van Gogh, what I have taken from him. I thought I'll offer back in a physical thing here. Actually, I gave it to them, liked it so much, I did another version for myself. Everything relates to everything else and everything feeds everything else. And there isn't a hierarchy of importance where the painting is the most important thing and the drawing is just a study. And it changes, you know, there'll be a period when he's totally obsessed with painting and then there will be a long period where he's playing with a fax machine or something. I then played with replica. This was a fax. You see, it leads on to all kinds of things. Uh, I played with an office copying machine. An office copying machine is a camera that moves to a flat surface and a printing machine. This was the first printing machine people had in a house. I, I might have been one of the first, but I do remember showing it once to Nikos Stangos, who'd come to visit me, and Nikos said, uh, you know, you couldn't own one of these in the Soviet Union. No individual could own a copying machine. And I remember saying, well, that place won't last that long. It's too like rejecting the telephone at the beginning of the century. You'd be quickly be backward. And probably technology had quite a lot to do with, ultra, with the, the demise of that system. And you realize if you have a Xerox machine, you're supposed to have a free press. I mean, you can make copies. You can, with the fax machine, even more. But I, it was the aspect of them being both a camera and a printer. That's interesting. We made then blow-ups of these faxes for this exhibition and played with, if you follow it, played with the notion of um, big things, uh, a duplicate. This is a duplicate of a duplicate. Uh, put an original there, so you know not, what's the original, what's the duplicate? There were rubber stamps, of course, I put them on. Uh, the machine makes things smaller, you could reduce, so I can put a picture within a picture, within a picture, just as if you had another camera here and went back, you'd see more, you'd see this camera, and you'd see something else, it becomes something else. Again, there's games there. It's using the same ideas. Here is just one, one photo I've taken with a 10 by 8 camera. I painted these flowers for my friend Jonathan, who was ill. Then I thought, well, just before I send it off to him, let's just take a photograph of it. 
So I just lean it up. Oh, well, we'll leave the motif there as well. Then I then thought, oh, wait a minute. I've just lent it against the table. If I get a piece of paper and lay it on the table, I could deceive the eye by looking through the camera. What would this do to look as though it stood up? So I, look, I have to look from only one point, of course. I do look through the camera and be able to know how to draw that and that. And the point was that we took the photograph, and then I thought, you know, those look more real than those do, I thought. So um, I called it, photography is dead, long live painting. He's very happy to contradict himself and to change his mind. It's his, his artist's uh, prerogative to do so. But what's interesting is that the taking of photographs began to obsess him. The reasoning here is uh, to get a whole figure in while you're still quite close. If you've got to know anybody uses a camera will realize uh, if you want the whole figure, you have to walk back away from it. That's the nature of lenses and so on. I mean, you're only seeing me to here because that's the way the camera is. And I was doing a painting, and it, round the corner, all those other portraits, you feel closer to them because I simply am closer, but it means you move down, you see, like that. Uh, uh, and therefore, there's no distortion. Uh, if I'm looking this way, if you pull your camera down, there's distortion happens and so on. So I'm trying to avoid that a bit, and I realize if you do that, it gives us uh, a better thing. He was trying to escape from this tradition of one-point perspective established in the Renaissance, where one was a static viewer looking through a frame like a window at an object beyond or at a space beyond. So this didn't entirely satisfy him because although he was playing with that space quite a lot within the rectangle, the overall impression was still that he was subservient to this Renaissance concept of space. And it was at that point that he started using other cameras, a 35 millimeter camera and a compact 110 camera, in order to be able to free himself both from the tyranny of the rectangle and from the tyranny of that one subject matter that had to be within a focal length of a few feet. And then I thought, let's go to the biggest hole I know, which is the Grand Canyon in Arizona, a thrilling space. Most people go and stand on the edge of it and are thrilled looking into it. I seem to think the thrill is from realizing the space, but it's got an edge, a defined edge, so you can see it. After all, you look up and the space is bigger, but we can't comprehend an edge to that. Uh, so the Grand Canyon is probably one of the biggest spaces you can see. It's 10 miles across, at some point you can see 50 miles up it, and you're looking into it, you know, not just on a flat surface, you're looking into it. This created a new set of problems, which is that if you're working with 35 millimeter camera or a compact 110 camera, of course, you don't see the pictures emerging as you make them. With a Polaroid, he, it took a long time. He had to wait 30 seconds or a minute for each photograph to be developed, and then he would take the next one. But he could make the picture in front of him and see what was missing and what he had to add. With a 35 millimeter camera, he had to do it all in his head. He had to remember exactly what he'd photographed already if he was piecing it together from dozens of photographs. And that was a tremendous feat of memory that was involved, of really sharpening his visual memory, which has stood him in incredibly good stead ever since. I'm stood in one place, and they're taken 
across that way. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm just stood with the cat. This is now, this, we're back now, 1982. Thrilled to think, ah, I found a way to photograph the Grand Canyon and show its grandeur. Never did we make them big, though, till this year. In 1982, I couldn't have made it this big because it would have cost a lot of money that I didn't have then. Uh, to make a photograph that big, in 1982, each one would have cost two or three hundred dollars that size. And at that scale, why would I pay out that when I wouldn't, wouldn't know what to do with it? So I'm not going to do that, you know? So they were just done small. Suddenly the technology has allowed you uh, a great deal cheaper, not that it's totally cheap, but each one now might cost fifteen, twenty dollars to make instead of three hundred. So um, it's possible to do it. I had a machine that you can do this with. There's a limitation on the paper. Eleven by seventeen is the maximum size of paper that you can put in the machine, but the machine will make the pictures bigger. It'll just make it on four sheets of paper back to the Polaroid, if we want it bigger, just put a few more there, you see. The process, I think, will last as much as any kind of photograph will, you know, color fades. It's fugitive in pictures like it is in life. I had a rubber stamp made to say that. That's when people ask me, how long does it last? How long do we last? How long does anything last? It's all transient, really. The Chinese, that's why they didn't put shadows there. Everything is a shadow, they think. I like that idea, really. But it's not easy to photograph, as I pointed out. I mean, now, when I watched your rushes, I did realize you couldn't read the Grand Canyon at all, not on the TV screen. And that was partly because, of course, it's printing ink, flat paper, not very physical and so on. So actually I went back to LA and realized I had to paint the Grand Canyon to make them work how I wanted. The first one was based on the photograph that was actually the big one in Cologne. Uh, 64 separate viewpoints, 64 canvases I made. Uh, and I'd visited the Grand Canyon just before I started it, but then I painted it in the studio in LA. And then I, immediately I'd finished it, I actually went to the Grand Canyon again. And my immediate reaction was, oh my God, everything is closer to you in real life here. Uh, that's what the photography's done, pushed it all back. I mean, it's unphotographable, actually. I mean, certainly the experience of it is unphotographable because it's a spatial experience. Your eyes have to move in every direction, just as they do at the Grand Canyon, and they do at the painting as well. They're doing the same thing. You have to look in every direction. Even in the 19th century, somebody observed there is no perspective at the Grand Canyon. There's no focus point. You simply have to look everywhere. So I thought, well, I want to paint another, and I'll do it from drawings there. Normal atmospheric techniques, which are a perspective technique, essentially atmospheric perspective is known, I did not want to use. If I put atmosphere, meaning dilute the colors with whites and things, uh, then it would stay there. It would not move with you, as it were. And after sitting there for a week, I'm not sure about atmosphere. Sometimes I would sit there for an hour and think everything I'm looking at is totally flat, almost. You can think that. It, you realize it is constantly changing, I mean, in front of you. I mean, this is you know, shadows. Uh, even if there was no clouds in the sky, you notice the shadows. I mean, if I was drawing I, and it take an hour, you know in one hour those shadows have moved. I mean, um, that happened to me. I would be drawing a shadow here, and then at the end of the drawing, it had actually gone. Uh, I added the sky 
right of the glass, which, which you would have done anyway. Uh, if you were doing it, you wouldn't have painted the sky. After all, it's the most fleeting aspect of uh, the scene there. And I think you can see that the further away back they are, the stronger the space seems to be. Just as the photograph disappeared into a rectangle, these don't. I just think that by making a painting out of a series of small canvases, um, almost subliminally, your eye is doing the same thing as it does when it looks at um, like the collage photographs of the Grand Canyon. Something slightly jerky about the process of your eye as you, as you try to take in all this in information. And maybe uh, it's something that he wanted to import from the photographs into the paintings. On the way to the Grand Canyon, uh, I'm driving. Anybody who drives knows you can't get back to photograph a steering wheel. You know, how do you, you'd have to get out of the way, get behind yourself and do this. Yet, on the way, I'm looking and uh, I realize, ah, here's another subject right in front of me. And I knew, figured out how to do it. Normally, the camera, you, anybody drives a car, has a camera, how do you do it? So I then picked other things that are close. I go to the dentist. Uh, dentists come in on you. Um, he's a friend of mine, this dentist in Hollywood. Hollywood has the best dentists. I have bad teeth, but you know, for movies, they want the good teeth and everything. Uh, I'm not, I don't have that kind of vanity in myself. I have another kind, but so anyway, I go to the dentist you can see, here's the feet in the chair. Uh, I know it looks like Dr. Frankenstein <laughs> or something. Uh, Merle hated it. In fact, it was just put away. This is probably the first time it was exhibited. Um, here's something where the camera normally couldn't get that close. The camera, in a sense, is becoming my body. It's taking my place, which is a bit difficult to grasp that idea, but it is possible, like the eyes, a camera can be an eye. It was a complicated process because there was, first of all, finding an appropriate subject, then taking all those photographs, which took a certain amount of time, even with a 35 millimeter camera, even with a quick camera, um, and then waiting for them to come back and then having to remake the picture as a collage. And there were still a lot of decisions to be made from those prints that came back. I was trying to show movement. We took the photographs, I sent them down to the photo map in Hollywood, and he didn't do them right. You know, normally they, they're pretty good. Um, two of the films, all here, were destroyed. Um, at first, I thought, oh, what a, you know, he got mad. And then there's a little note from Tom. Dear Mr. Hockney, I'm very sorry about the two rolls of film. It was an accident. We thought we had pushed the button. I, I look at the note and think, well, what am I going to do? It's ruined. But I thought, well, no, I might as well put the note. That's a part of it. That's what happened. Why not use the accident? Uh, so I we photographed the note as well for another one. Uh, and so it's part of it. So, well, use whatever happens. Use the accident. I was also in Yorkshire taking photographs. So I just bought a little camera in Bridlington. I sent them to Boots, the chemist. They kept saying to me, is there a lot of stuff to photograph in Bridlington? I said, no, nah, more than you think, you know. Again, they think. It's just out there. It's not the beauty is in the process of seeing. I know that. So um, I put it together in a different way. That is maybe an hour of looking. Uh, here is actually two months. Uh, I'm looking rather more carefully at a landscape in a different way, a landscape that I've known since my childhood here. And it's a, an agricultural landscape, meaning the surface of the earth is altered constantly. And I observed that over two months, different surfaces. 
I gave it the title Husbandry in the East Riding. Uh, I knew the word husbandry is, what, medieval English from the Bible. My assistant Richard, what is this? What do you mean, husbandry? I said, well, it means uh, agriculture, looking after surface, animals, uh, husbanding. It's a medieval world. Look it up. He looked it up then, liked it. I'm aware of each frame. Nevertheless, the longer you look, you realize there's bits that fit. Uh, it's, I was also painting seamlessly, in a way. I was painting at the same time as this. They're in Saltaire uh, now because I was painting Yorkshire for my friend, Jonathan, uh, who'd always wanted me to paint Yorkshire again, but I was too impatient, always wanting to get back to my dogs. Suddenly I realized uh, my, the emotional pull was there for that time, so I could do it. They were quite joyful because I'm showing them to Jonathan, who thinks the world is beautiful. Somebody said to me, were they very sad? I said, well, not absolutely visible like that, you know, I mean, I'm not going to drive over painting skulls and stuff like that. If your friend's very ill, you don't do that, do you? You know, you try and do it something else. And so that related directly to painting, and I put it together here. He's gone hot and cold about photography all his life, really, uh, taking from it when he wanted, uh, turning against it when he found it too limiting getting very excited about it again when he was doing these photo collages, learning a lot from it in terms of how to represent objects in space, how to create a, a feeling of time unfolding within a two-dimensional surface, and then turning against it again. I think it's quite a, a revolutionary thing that he did there. Um, and I think you can also see how in his painting He's trying to do the same sort of thing, but it's, it's, it's different because he's actually applying pigment to canvas, but he's trying to get movement and timelessness and multiple points of view and, and defeat the tyranny of the, of the two-dimensional plane. I keep stopping exploring with the camera, going back to painting and, uh, or the theatre. Uh, and uh, I, I discovered Chinese scrolls, which are quite a different way of making a picture. And, of course, they're not known because they can't be reproduced in a book. Even the book page turns over on itself and these unravel. In the opposite way, this is going that way, these went that way. Um, this is a roll as well, isn't it? But it's that way. And I, of course started trying to develop it in painting. This was called A Visit to Christopher and Don, a uh, friend of mine in California, whose house I went to a lot, and they lived on the edge of Santa Monica Canyon. That's, you know, a V like this, and their house was here, and on the edge of it was a house that's not there anymore. The last earthquake, it fell into the sea, and, uh, but that was the point. You came down a road, uh, and 145, Adelaide Drive, that's where it was, cars parked, and then you descended a staircase into the living room. That house you saw through the living room as well. Don's studio, upstairs and downstairs, you are always seeing this house. It's not different houses, it's the same house, seen from different rooms. Uh, you then walk through, uh, you see it again, the dining area, you're seeing it again, um, you're seeing it again, here's, you're walking past the television set. The perspective is therefore that way. If it went that way, you'd have stopped. Uh, it, your eye would stop. I found also if you had a horizontal and a vertical, the eye stops. 
you have to keep it flowing. Again, here's Christopher in his study typing. Uh, the house is seen yet again through his window. You were always looking out at it. And it took me quite a while to construct it. And then when I explained it, you begin to see it. And uh, uh, it came out of those other photographs. Do you see? Los Angeles is, in a way, a very ugly city. And Los Angelinos, in my experience, are always apologizing uh, for their city and say, oh, have you been to San Francisco? Um, it's so much nicer. Uh, but of course, for non-Los uh, Angeles denizens, the, the city does have a, an amazing appeal because it's so familiar and so much, of, so much movie history has taken place there. So even some grubby diner in a back street has a, a certain allure. Um, and Hockney, I suppose, took more of the suburban myths of the, the plate glass cabana and the and the everybody with their own swimming pool and and use them for his for his own artistic ends but of course they're commonplace in california and it took maybe that eye from cold bleak north of england to see how you know wonderfully alluring they were I then went back to photography. I was asked by Vanity Fair, was it, I think, American magazine, to illustrate a story by a writer I knew about searching for Lolita again in the southwestern United States. It was about driving in the desert, in the open spaces. I think they really wanted me to do Lolita, but somehow I responded to the driving. As you drive in California a lot, driving around, you see things in a bit of a different way. You're seeing it through time, speed, memory, how, what did I see back there, and so on. So I find a subject out on Pear Blossom Highway, just over the mountains from Los Angeles, over the San Gabriel Mountains, I find an area and think, I'm now going to try and depict this space. I'd already realized I needed a ladder. It took about seven days to photograph. This one I did, had to construct out in the desert because I couldn't ever remember what to do Although it looks like an ordinary picture at first, quickly you begin to realize it isn't. There's, you are actually moving about in it. I'll point out why you needed a ladder to do it. You see, the stop sign, if you look at that bit, I'm right in front of it. If I was down on the ground looking up, it would be doing that. I had the ladder to be right in front of it. I'm out there in the desert, up a ladder. Eventually, we find a helicopter coming over, kind of police or something, thinking, what's that guy doing? You know, I realize how ridiculous he must look. I'm up a ladder photographing a stop sign, the Pear Blossom Highway sign. You realize you're right next to these things. You can actually read the lettering here. I am moving all over here, I'm over there. To do the lettering on the road, I'm again up the ladder looking down. It looks as though it's from one point out here, but you quickly realize it isn't, it can't be. I ended then, it seemed to me finished now back to painting, went back to the theatre for a bit, for two or three years, elaborate work in the theatre. Working for the theatre was a natural thing for him to do, and also because he had been using theatrical devices in his paintings. Uh, the theatre, again, of course, 
is deeply about perspective and illusions beyond frames and so on. Uh, I was fascinated by that. I think we did uh, Tristan and Isolde in Los Angeles, an opera where everything is out of doors. And it was a very major source of influence on his other work, working with uh, real space, working with coloured lights, working with time, all, of, all those things became very important to him in his painting. How do you put nature on the stage, not with verisimilitude? If you put a real tree on the stage and you're sitting back there, you know how far you are from the tree. If you put, as the Chinese would say, treeness there, instead of a tree, you might be right up against it. The ship, I remember, I put big lines on the mast, so when you looked at that bit, you were on the ship close to it. The music suggested this, marvellous music, great, marvellous piece, four and a half hours of ecstasy. My friend said he was too long. I said, how could four and a half hours of ecstasy be too long? He knows that there are certain things he doesn't want to do at the moment, like he doesn't want to do another work for the stage because he's found it too time-consuming and too enervating uh, at times, working with so many other people and all the complexities of getting something staged and not feeling that it's completely under his control. I've kept saying, you, you know, pictures aren't separated. They were telling me painting is dead. I'm saying it's photography that's dying or changing. It's moving into painting, actually. Uh, I was going to write an article for Modern Painters, is television dead? point out its weaknesses, uh, was the audience really there, is it different, what's going to happen. The problem is, the moment you move into an art of time, we have to restrict it a bit, it gets edited severely. Still pictures can be seen in a different way. You bring your time to it. The moving picture brings its time to you. Whether he goes back to photography or painting or continues drawing is, is anybody's guess. I don't think he would be able to tell you himself. He, he, he will tell you he has one plan and then six months will pass and he hasn't got back to it yet because he's become so absorbed in, in some other activity. It's not as simple as it looks. <laughs> you know, everybody likes to take photographs. It's a very accessible medium, in a way. And the moment people see, well, yes, you can show the world a bit bigger. I think people could take it now further. I mean, somebody can start and realize what it does. I, mean, I walked through the exhibition with nobody here, and uh, when I got in here, I also realized um, the journey was to a kind of silence. Uh, there's a visual silence here, and also that's happening to me in the sense I'm losing my hearing, which is why I talk all the time. It stops, you know, you don't have to listen if you talk. It occurred to me that that might also be a subject here, in a way. Silence is not a visual thing, in a w and we think, but it occurred to me. And I liked it being here on my own, I must admit. Uh, each one of those is one person looking at a quiet place. This too is a quiet place. Uh, that's it, that's, uh, I'll have to have a drink of water and I'm finished, thank you. He needs the constant new challenge and a new stimulation uh, and he likes uh, the possibilities offered by technology as well for what that can give him a different quality of mark, a different quality of colour. Uh, it's all just another way for him of making a picture, and I think 
in a way for him it doesn't matter too much is that a painting is that a drawing is that a photograph um it's making pictures that that thrills him so much and that he can't stop himself from doing now like most artists only interested in what you're doing now uh I tend to forget about other stuff. I don't hold inquests much. Uh, there's only now, essentially. Uh, it's always now, isn't it? Catch up with the latest in our series Talks Music as guitar legend Jeff Beck discusses the passions and pressures of life in the music business with Malcolm Gary. That's tonight at 11.